before the video begins, we wanted to take a moment to make you aware of our webpage, EngageEastNoble.net. First, if you go to the page, go to Goals for Positive Change. Here you can see a simple list of five pillars and some objectives under each. Focus on and improve academics, protect our children, improve governance and policies, support the parents, support educators and staff. I would encourage you to visit this page and take a look at the bullet points under each. Next, let's talk about books. We're building a resource out here for parents. First, we built instructions for parents to navigate the East Noble book catalog. Next, we've provided over a dozen resources with ratings and book reviews from other concerned parents. And we're building a list of obscene books that can be found or have been found at East Noble. We also have suggested a concept called default opt out. This page goes into some detail as to what that means, but to put it simply, it's informed consent for parents. So no student will be exposed to obscene or harmful materials without their parents' expressed written consent. Let's talk about the election. We've got information out here about the board and administration. The election is a rather confusing process for many. People are not familiar with how the seats are set. They're not familiar with how the voting takes place, so we've explained this out here in some detail, and we will come back later and discuss details about each candidate. Finally, there's a lot of information out there about Engage East Noble. There are perceptions that are simply not true. If you'd like to find out who and what we are, this is the place to go. Thanks for taking a couple of minutes to get a tour of the website. I hope you visit soon. And with that said, our first speaker tonight is Anne Craig. Anne Craig, Fort Wayne Public Schools. Michael Schaefer, Director of Ball State's Educational Leadership Program, recently wrote, Prior to starting my doctoral studies, my mind was closed more tightly than a rusty old bailing craft. He said he was not very inclusive, not really, uh, he didn't really appreciate diversity, and didn't even know what equity was. But then a professor, with whom he often disagreed, taught him to ponder and consider other viewpoints. Schaefer now recognizes that it is problematic and actually dangerous to allow Christian nationalists to squash free thought. That same day, the Journal Gazette carried another opinion piece by retired civil rights attorney David Hoffman, who agrees with Schaefer. Hoffman writes, tyranny thrives upon ignorance. With education, Hoffman continues, we question, we are curious, and we recognize untruths. Both Schaefer and Hoffman believe that an attack on education is an attack on democracy. I was very troubled during the comment section last month, and really in previous months too. I recognize that much of my discomfort is the result of how concerns are delivered to the board. On the back of the agenda sheet, there's a description of appropriate public participation. It shall not be harassing or abusive. If I were on the board or an EM administrator or a teacher, I would feel abused and harassed. These board members and EM staff are your good, are your neighbors. They are board members and educators because they care about all children. They deserve our respect and support. At the age of 73, I know that negativity is a waste of energy. I know that anger interferes with productivity. I know that parents, school personnel, and community should work together respectfully for the good of all children. Our next speaker is Claudia Knott. Hello, board. I'm Dr. Claudia Knott, retired educator. Uh, my concern tonight is uh, East Noble's LGBTQ students who are in the extreme rights hateful line of fire. Um, LGBTQ, these are letters that represent adjectives that indicate gender and sexual identities. Identities are a core part of all human beings. They just might vary. Gender and sexual orientation originate within people's hearts, psyches, and souls, not from outside forces which can make or unmake identity in their own image. LGBTQ people, whether they are 16 or 106, know this truth. One of your critics recently said that the LGBTQ movement harms kids because it teaches them that their feelings determine the truth about themselves. No, the movement protects kids who already know who they are. It protects them from homophobia. That would be like saying the civil rights movement harmed black Americans because it taught them that their fear of the Klan was real. 
Imagine how LGBTQ kids feel when they realize and they see this list that their very existence or the existence of LGBTQ family and friends is defined as a problem or a social danger. Imagine how LGBTQ youth feel when their innate humanity and goodness are denigrated and denied. In other words, imagine what it feels like to be told that you are defective and not fully human, and then imagine that this happens to you daily. These are young people. I'm 73, and I've lived in a homophobic world for quite a while. And when I see the L listed, because I'm the L, and my very existence is objected to, then I think about these kids. And I am hoping that the board always keeps that in mind. Who wants their child or anybody's child to be dehumanized in this way? One would think nobody. And yet this is precisely what fascism and the Christian right do to justify the soul murder and the literal annihilation of the people that views as defective and subhuman. This is not hyperbole. If you shame my child because his father is gay, if you hate my lesbian child, if you drive my trans child to suicide or worse, if you teach your children to do the same, your ignorance and hatred are the problem, not our LGBTQ children who, like all children, are beautiful, miraculous, and precious. Thank you. Sherry Caldwell. I have a great place to say. Sure. Uh, mine, good evening, my name is Sherry Caldwell. I lived at 624 North Riley Street in Underville <coughs> for over 40 years. My issue this evening is bullying in the schools. Whether you have been made aware of anything that's going on, I'm here to give you some information that you need to know. This young man has been bullied a lot this school year. Um, and I would like if you would look at your policies and procedures as to how this is addressed and what is being done and how I am supposed to be told other than I've taken care of it. I want to know more than that. He, he has been bullied because of the color of his skin and to the side of that, the fact that he doesn't have a mother. However, this last Friday, another student threatened to kill him. This is so unacceptable. I have been told that this has been taken care of, but the student is still in school. This should be taken very seriously. Is my grandson the only child that this student has pulled? I don't know. Apparently the parents have been talked to. This has been raised as discussion every time we've gone to parent-teacher conferences. I know at least one time a parent had been talked to. And I would like to see this child expelled for at least three days. And on top of that, I would like to see him get some psych counseling. And I'm not talking about the school psychologist. I want a psychiatrist to have a look at him to see where the manifestation is of his behavior problem. If this is an ADHD student, or something well beyond any scope that somebody's not seeing. I don't, under, I don't know what the consequences were for this child. The principal could only tell me that it's been taken care of. But in the East Noble School policy, she could not tell me what was done to this child. And I guess I'm a little unaware. Am I done? Thank you. We do have Chris and Kim Meadow. Is this sick? No. <laughs> <laughs> we'll share. <laughs> 
We just wanted to tell you all the really great things that are happening within our show choir program at the high school. Uh, we just came back from state finals and we are your state runners up for the premier edition this year out of the program. And we're super grateful that over the last five years we've been able to develop a program that starts at the sixth grade and works all the way through high school to have both of us in classrooms for both of our periods of uh, competitive show choir and uh, not only did we have the, the first runner up girl choir in the state, we also had the 10th place mixed choir in the state. So it, that group has also come a long way too in the last five years and that kind of has started with her building blocks at the middle school. And we're just grateful for all the board support and for all the administrative support in the buildings and uh, we just want to say thank you and let you know the great things that we're doing. Ditto. Thank you. Joel Lash. Uh, I just want to speak about the new building that you guys are wanting to build uh, for 10 to 20 students, where you're wanting to spend anywhere from three to five million dollars for 10 to 20 students. There uh, last year was 3,450 students in the East Noble School Corporation and has a federal budget of 4.6 million uh, for one year with that federal funding. Uh, the elementary school, the proficiency of reading and math at expectations is only 29% and 35% for reading and math. Middle school is only at 29% on reading and 27% on math. High school is at 50% reading proficiency and 37% reading proficiency and a 92% graduation rate. That means 42% of the high schoolers that graduated can read and 55% of them knows their math. I would suggest the other funds be put in other areas that can help more students versus just 10 or 20. I would like to see maybe trade school, the trades, uh, trade schools, maybe they need more equipment. I'm sure they'd love to take it. I'm sure they'd love more equipment for their show choir. I would like to see those funds dispersed among more children, especially uh, instead, of, instead of policies that are only gonna affect such a little amount of people, why can't we use those funds that are going to affect more people? I understand that you want to use the building as probably uh, an expense, a depreciation over 20, 29 years on a commercial property, but other things can also be written off as write-offs, like training for the teachers, letting them know what the laws are, um, extra extracurricular activities, scholarships, so many things that we can do with three to five million dollars versus build a great big building for 10 students and I can give my one other minute to somebody else. I'm done, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Jasmine Sparkman. Jasmine Sparkman, I'm a resident of the Villa Indiana. <clears throat> I am a mom of four kids who currently attend school at various locations in East Noble School District. I was speaking today as someone who wants to see a resolution to the unrest that we have in our school district. I was speaking as someone who wants to urge officials to hear parents and, once, and also as someone who wants to encourage parents to continue communication respectfully with their school officials about our, about our children's education. While I've had my own personal experiences with my children, I feel as if there's a possibility to make a great first stride in extending an olive branch, if you will, to parents and school officials alike so we can begin to move forward in repairing relationships between parents and administrators for the sake of our children. After taking the time to do my own research and gather facts and opinions from parents and administrators alike, I'd like to make a suggestion that I believe everyone can possibly see as fair. I would like to see East Noble Schools incorporate a disclaimer into syllabuses regarding material our children may be exposed to in the curriculum. I believe by putting a disclaimer that reads to the effect of, please note, some suggested and or adult themes and language could be present in the materials assigned. If you have any questions, please reach out to your child's teacher for further explanation. I'd like to see this be a requirement that students have for a parent to sign and then return these syllabuses to their teachers. I believe in doing so, it shows that our school district cares about parental rights to know what our children are exposed to in their daily curriculum, and it also allows teachers the comfort of knowing parents have been encouraged and actively have taken part in their child's education by allowing parents to research the material. I believe this small gesture could help fight some of the unrest we are facing, and I believe it would be a great show of mutual respect for all, parents, teachers, administrators, and students alike. I think if increased communication from parents were to become a bit of a concern for teachers, that in order to negate the workload of the teachers who may have parents reach out to them, some quotes from the materials could also be included on the syllabus. This could possibly help parents to understand further those adult and suggested themes before having to resort to reaching out to teachers. 
I think implementation of this practice in the 2024-2025 school year would be practical, and I believe in doing so, we are taking a great first step in coming together to heal the unrest, but most importantly, we are showcasing to our children how adults can work out their differences respectfully in a way that truly benefits everyone. Thank you. Brett Carpenter. <clears throat> Proverbs says, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. In other words, it's about actions and not talk. Nice talk, respectful talk is how people deceive others. Jesus was often disrespectful to the leaders of his community, but he always did what was right. Now, I've noticed a terrible trend here. The superintendent and the sport, they speak, they speak respectfully and nice to the parents, but they act terribly towards the students. In the first meeting about a transgender policy that the board had to write up, the board was confused, thinking that it was about allowing the accused to appeal, when it was actually allowing the grievant to appeal. When we exposed this misunderstanding, Teresa put out a newsletter saying, we hear and understand the community's concerns regarding the sensitive topic. The very next thing, the board passed a policy that does not guarantee that a boy will be removed from girls' sports. Sounds good was not good. In at least two board meetings, the superintendents announced that any parent could make a list of objectionable books that they don't want their children to read, and the school would make sure that the children don't have access to those books. Sounds good. It does absolutely nothing to keep obscene literature out of children's hands. Parents have no idea which books contain sexual explicit material. I did a simple calculation. The only way a parent can make an effective list to protect their children is to read 100 books every day of the school year. So, sounds nice, we hear you, we respect you, but the board voted to keep obscenity in curriculum. Exactly the opposite. Sounds good, it's terrible. Teresa said at a board meeting that we have an option if we want to take our child out of a class that's teaching objectionable material. I opted my child out. A couple days later, I got a nasty, disrespectful letter from the principal saying that I can look for another school if I feel what's being taught at East Noble doesn't align with my morals. I posted the letter on engageeastnoble.net. Talk good, sounds good to the parents, it's terrible to the children. The psalmist said, draw me not away with the wicked and with the workers of iniquity, which speak peace to their neighbors, but mischief is in their hearts. It's time to start acting in a good manner towards the children. Talk is cheap. It's actions that count. All right, we're moving to our next topic. Um, we need to uh, make sure that uh, we're okay with our minutes from our last meeting of February 21st. That was in your packet. Uh, I'm sure you've had a chance to review that. And is there a motion to approve it? I'll second. We have a motion from Mrs. Blackman to approve the notes seconded by Mr. Trulo. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries 6-0. Also in your packet were the claims of March 20th and presented. If, uh, does anyone have any questions about those? Is there a motion to approve the claims as presented? I'll make a motion to approve as written. <coughs> Second. We have a motion by Dr. Jansen, seconded by Mrs. Klein. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries 6 0. <laughs> Moving to personnel, board in your packet were uh, resignations, retirements, and terminations. You have a chance to look at those. I'll make a motion to approve. We have a motion. I'll second. We have a motion by Mrs. Klein. A second by Dr. Jansen to approve the, uh, the resignations, retirements, and terminations as presented. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries 6 0. Resignations, retirements, and terminations. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, reassignments. We have in your we have one two reassignments that were in your packet. 
I'll draw a motion to approve those. I'll make a motion to approve the assignments. I'll second. <coughs> we have a motion from Mrs. Blackman, second by <coughs> Mr. Anderson, to approve the reassignments as presented. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed? That motion carries 6 0. New hires. In your packet, we have some new hires. These are the Tool Corporation. We have a chance to review those. Are there? I'll entertain a motion to approve those as presented. I'll make a motion. I'll second. We have a motion by Mrs. Klein, seconded by Mr. Anderson to approve our new hire list. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries six zero. Uh, we also have an additional um, hire uh, as an instructional assistant. Um, all those in favor of that additional hire uh, in the motion? I'll make a motion to approve. I'll second. <clears throat> We have a motion from Mr. Anderson, a second from um, Mr. Chula to approve that additional hire. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries 6 0. Leave requests. Uh, we have a couple of leave requests in there. Uh, motion I'll make, to approve. I'll make a motion to accept as written. A motion to accept as written from um, Dr. Hansen. Second from Mrs. Blackman to approve our relief request. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries 6 0. At this time, we move to instruction and we invite uh, our Bell Elementary School personnel to listen for the learning about the preschool intake process. Yeah. Good evening. Thank you for allowing us to present today. Uh, I'm Jeff Harper, principal here at Villa Elementary. We serve kindergarten through fifth grade students, but we also serve the entire corporation preschool program. So, my initial slide set had about 35 slides when I was kind of planning this together and getting it ready for everybody, and we brought it down to seven. So, it's you're getting a nutshell version of our intake process and procedures. So, there are main, two main pathways to get into our preschool as a preschool student. We've got our spring roundup that takes place, and that's with any community students that want to come in, their parents are interested, they can come in and take a tour, put their names in, put a request a spot, and then we also have early intervention via special education. So at this time, I'd just like to have our central office staff that are part of the early intervention preschool intake team come on up. They'll be speaking a little bit later on some of their specific roles. You want to come over here? Yes. Really awesome. We're going to highlight the next time. So if you just want to introduce yourself to your role. I'm Caitlin Cowan. I'm a school psychologist. I'm Tammy Householder. I'm a behavior consultant, the preschool education team, autism team leader, and non public teacher program. I'm Katie Hilligaris. I'm your secretary for the special ed department. I'm in the back. I'm your master's and I'm the director of student services. So these lovely people are. <laughs> and we're missing one member, Caitlin Green. She's a speech pathologist that will um, assess students as they come into the central office process. So, although they're not in our school every day, this team is very important to the process. We can't have a student come into our program without being known pretty well by this team of people. So, up next, I'd like to have our classroom teachers come on up, our preschool teachers. <laughs> Instructional assistants. Come on up if you're here. It's about the visuals. Excuse me, I'm here with Austin. I'm Rebecca Monahan. I'm Melody Williams. And we are missing. 
co-hosting Carrie McClellan and Danielle Jordan this evening. And then myself, I'm here um, as principal of the school, but I'm also considered preschool director. And then we have Joe Flowers. She is our treasurer of the school. Many of you know her. She is beloved by the community. She's amazing. We know that she runs a lot of process of the old school. We could not run preschool without her. And then Megan Rodenbeck, she is our office assistant, assistant and she has really come together with our central office staff to make that process much smoother between central office and the school level. So we're kind of going to talk about the students we serve. We serve three to five year old students across East Double. Typically developing students are in district and out of district. So if you're at the Cal Garrett Central Level, any of our neighboring schools, and you're a, what we would call a typically developing student, we have many of those students that choose our preschool. If you are an early intervention special education student, that is inside of East Noble's district only. We currently serve 113 students, and our teachers can tell you we have a handful that are coming in before the end of the year. Tammy is nodding her head, and she's gonna talk about that process soon. So we do have the early intervention and typical students learning together. You would go into a classroom, you can't tell the difference between the two categories of students learning. And this process kind of lays out, it's, I tried to condense it into four steps, but it's really probably, if we would pass a baton back and forth from person to person on how we have to have the student come in with their family to the end point of being in a classroom, that baton would be passed up to 30 times depending on the situation. So the central office team receives information about a child that is inquiring about special education services at the preschool level. Um, and then we go into the student evaluation. So we're gonna go ahead and back up, talk about number one just a little bit, Tammy. Um, so the, a student or a parent will call, and it could be based on a parent concern. It could be based on a community preschool, the YMCA. Um, the daycare, they have concerns about a child, they will reach out to the parent, advise the parent to contact Amy. She is our main starting person. Um, it also could be from a doctor saying something's not quite right, have, go call them and have your child evaluate. Um, so we also work with First Steps, which Amy's the data manager for that, and they have to be evaluated by their third birthday. So we are on a rotating basis with them. We get names of kids. We have to then, I attend a transition meeting with the First Steps people and the parents, and then we start the evaluation process from there. So once we set up, um, we have those names, that information, we <coughs> set up an intake, and Caitlin and I do that. We have the parent come in with the child, and we just get information. What are their concerns? What are, if there's OT concerns, PT concerns, speech concerns, and then we generate what's called a referral. <clears throat> we cannot do anything without a parent's signature. So we do kind of an informal observation when the child comes in, and we kind of determine what are we gonna look at here. It could be autism, it could be a developmental delay, it could be a speech only, there could be physical concerns, gross motor concerns, fine motor concerns, we kind of take all of that in very quickly. Um, and then we set up what's called the arena evaluation. So depending on what we're looking at for each child, that could involve Caitlin, it will involve Caitlin, it will involve me, it could involve Caitlin Green, Courtney Ziso, Heather Hinman, Donna Heinrichson if there's a blind or vision concern, Chris Traffy if there's a deaf or hearing concern. So there is a lot of people that come in and work with that child um, for that arena assessment. And that can take anywhere from 45 minutes to two hours per child. So after that, everybody submits a report to Caitlin, and then Caitlin's job is to, turn, to determine eligibility for that child. So she takes all of the information that we gather, plus the testing that she does, and I'm gonna let her talk about real quick, and combines that into a report, and then it, it's passed off to the bus. So, so the main things we tend to look at for eligibility are typically developmental delays. So we look at that looks at five different areas. We look at um, cognitive or intellectual abilities, communication, social emotional skills, adaptive skills, and physical skills. 
So we try, even with little two-year-olds, to give them an IQ test. It does not always work, but we try. <laughs> um, and uh, we also, depending on their age, will do formal academic testing or we get that information through play. Um, another category or eligibility category that we've looked at a lot in the past few years that I've been here is autism spectrum disorder. We've seen a lot of that, so we might do a formal autism assessment as well. Um, so that's why it can range from 45 minutes if they don't have a lot going on to two hours if, there's, if they need those PT, uh, physical therapy, occupational therapy evaluations. Um, speech, she often comes in and does her own testing, but she might observe as well. So it's, it's quite a process and the kids do really well with switching between lots of different people um, and we get a lot of information in that time period and we um, hear that from you So that's that. <laughs> as far as the evaluation. Yeah, so the only visual representation we're missing is a parent and a child, okay? But that's, that's a big group of people. Um, really wanted to give them a stage tonight to kind of honor them and what they do because we've gotten down to step four in that student placement. And steps one, two, and three are really, like I said, so many steps. It's, it's kind of countless depending on the student. Um, but really, we're proud of that student placement process that we have now because we've really changed over time. This is the fourth year that we have housed the program kind of under its current makeup. And we've changed that process tremendously to where it's, it's little known about the student before they come here to a villa. We kind of have to be informed and meet the student and, and get to better understand them as we get them arriving here for their first day of school. So now having them in for an observation before they ever even start preschool. So um, I have to applaud this team. They're amazing, we couldn't do this without them. And uh, yeah, thank all of you for coming tonight. Thank you, Zola. Um, our next um, item on the agenda is an action <coughs> Uh, in high school courses for the 24-25 school year. Uh, those within your packet, I believe there were two English classes and one for E-class. If you have a chance to review those or any questions you might have. I'll make a motion to accept it. Here. Second. We have a motion by Dr. Jansen. and a second by Mrs. Blackman to approve the three new high school courses effective in uh, 24.5 school year. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries 6 0. That moves us to business. Uh, Mr. Leach. All right, board. As we are approaching uh, spring break, which I think many of us uh, are looking forward to, um, take a little bit of time off, but there's still a lot, a lot of work to be done. Many of us will still be. Uh, in the office and around the, around the district working on several different items. Um, one thing we're preparing for is for our summer help. Uh, each summer we, we hire uh, individuals, uh, try to hire students, but uh, lately it's also been some, some adults uh, to help with the mowing crews, the painting crews, uh, the landscaping, and just you know, maintain our, our facilities uh, throughout the summer. Painting projects, uh, moving teachers from classroom to classroom, additional cleaning and so forth. Um, in the past, uh, actually last year was the first year that we actually talked about increasing the wage prior to a July 1 start, which typically our raises will be discussed uh, in May and June uh, for a July 1 start for our classified staff and for our administrators. But last year for the summer help, we wanted to increase a little bit sooner before we started advertising for these positions so we could try and be competitive with area of business and industry. Uh, that worked out fairly well this year, but we still find ourselves uh, needing to raise that a little bit uh, to try to, again, stay competitive with the local business industry. So in your packet, board, a recommendation to increase the uh, summer uh, maintenance help, uh, the summer crew, from $14.25 an hour to $15 an hour. Um, that'll be effective April 16th, 17th? Middle of April. Any questions regarding that? April 15th. I'll make a motion to approve his written. I'll second. There's a motion by Dr. Jansen, second by Mrs. Klein, to raise the uh, hourly rate of our summer home um, $14.25 to $15 an hour. So we're competitive. 
in the multi drop market. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries 6 0. The second and last item under business, uh, you also received a packet of information with items we asked you uh, deem as obsolete so we can move forward and sell them either on eBay or uh, remove in the most cost effective manner. I'll make a motion to approve as presented. I'll second. We have a motion by Mr. Trulock, seconded by Dr. Jansen to um, get rid of some obsolete items. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries 6 0. Okay, thank you. That takes us down to a few items of discussion for the board. Um, first one is the uh, Education Foundation. Um, I've had the opportunity, I thoroughly enjoyed that opportunity, um, probably worked on those things for about the last four or five months. Um, a few kind of where we're at, uh, and just first and foremost, we're, this is not an East Noble School Corporation function or entity. It's a separate entity, and um, it is not an extension of our school corporation. Financially, it's, it's not impacted. Uh, East Noble Corporation, School Corporation is not impacted by this. Uh, it's totally, totally separate. Um, you know, there's lots of things, and, and we're excited to know. We believe that uh, creation of the East Noble uh, Foundation uh, will increase and enhance um, many educational opportunities for our, not just our students and staff, but for the entire East Noble community. And uh, it will be organized as a 501C. Uh, uh, program to be a uh, non nonprofit organization. Um, they, you want to follow the internal revenue codes and uh, they're quite pretty extensive, uh, not very fun to read. Um, and you know, the goal and the, the vision will be that the foundation is going to provide an avenue uh, for all of our stakeholders to promote excellence in education as well as an exchange where positive results are celebrated. And uh, that's kind of, those three things we've, we've kind of agreed upon. Um, we currently have six confirmed members that are willing to serve on our inaugural board. Um, and we have a seventh member that's almost positive committing to that. There are ex officio members, of which the superintendent, one board member, and right now, uh, Chief Financial Operations Officer, um, that might change a little bit as we um, grow as an entity and uh, have our own secretary who takes care of finances. And uh, so, but right now, that's kind of the plan. Um, we, we've got a uh, draft copy of bylaws that are pretty close to being a spot, a first first step of the process. We have a, a few small things to clean up on that, but we're very close to a, uh, the process of applying to the state for that 501c3. And once we get approved for that, that uh, we can move forward. Uh, we do have another meeting after uh, spring break. So, um, and, and, and quite honestly, my spring break is could be 52 weeks a year. So <laughs> whenever that is. So, um, but we're excited about that. Uh, I've had the opportunity to talk to, I think seven other, seven or eight, I can't remember, I've got them all written down and typed in a folder, um, other uh, foundations in the area, some down south, some in our, our home neighborhoods here, and uh, not one of them said that uh, it was easy to do, but they all concur that the, the outcome for our community, our entire community, that's just been a blessing for them. So um, we're certainly in the infancy stages, and that's kind of where we're at. I guess anything I can answer for you or try. Dave, did they elaborate on how that's been a fruitful thing? They did. Um, number one, it, it helps from a financial standpoint for our students and our staff. Um, you know, field trips, sometimes they can fund those types of activities, scholarships through the Education Foundation are, are many, and, and um, there are some things, some, some research opportunities for our staff. There are some professional development opportunities for our staff. Uh, it's it's a, a way to celebrate the successes of the entire school community. Um, 
<coughs> one of the schools was fortunate enough to become a state champion in an athletic event a few years ago, and the Education Foundation um, basically sponsored a community celebration, kind of like a cookout. And, um, I believe they bought the rings for state championship team members. So um, hopefully that can happen here someday with this, uh, Mr. Matter. So um, next year, maybe, uh, champions. But there's just lots of things that I think foundations are set up to serve and, and uh, improve efforts. So I, I you know, it's been a, a discussion probably for a couple of years about starting that, and uh, it, it does take some work. So but that's kind of where we're at. Thank you. So, Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate that. Thank you. Brian, I know you got a couple of things. Yeah, so uh, board uh, tonight, I want to kind of give you an update on where we're at with uh, the design of the process, the potential project of a new alternative learning learning center. Um, so I'm going to share you some some updates, uh, get into discussion with you as as the board. Um, kind of <coughs> back a little bit here, uh, the facility that we're looking at, the uh, current facility, uh, actually houses between 40 and 50 students currently. I do know if there are more students at. The high school that would want to get in, but right now there isn't there isn't space for them. Um, whether it be the staffing or uh, with just space uh, in in general, the alternative learning center is, is strictly that. It's an alternative placement it is not only for students that uh, are having discipline issues. Uh, it's also for students that just need an alternative uh, form of education, whether that be kind of a go at your own pace uh, or more of a one-on-one uh, -on -one with some of our staff, uh, or, or what have you. So it is truly an alternative uh, style of, of learning as opposed to uh, a, a typical high school setting. So um, the current building is about 7,000 square feet. Uh, there is a team that's been working with the architects and engineers in, in this process, uh, as well as our uh, CPA firm, uh, Baker Tilly, uh, Mark Cohen Dolman's the, engineer, the, the engineers and architects that, that we're working with. Team has met uh, two or three different times now, so these are all continued to be evaluated. Matter of fact, what I'm showing you here is not the most recent updated we met yesterday. Uh, those updates have not been able to make it into this plan. We worked on about uh, three or four different floor plans. Uh, this is the one that we're, uh, we decided to spend most of our time on right now. Um, so these, these images, nothing is set in stone, nothing is final. These are all continued uh, conversations uh, with the staff. Uh, both at the current facility from the high school uh, as well as the central office. Um, we continue to evaluate, uh, draw new lines, move group, rooms around, uh, trying to get the, the, the biggest bang for the buck. Uh, this square footage is somewhere around 7,400 square feet, so it's a little bit bigger than our current facility, uh, but this one might be much more for our students than what currently has. It's on uh, a larger uh, plot of land, we have our two acre plot of land, um, which will provide some green space, some outdoor, uh, fresh air time for, for our students, which we don't have a lot of that uh, now. They get bought up on, on asphalt blacktop, you know, where cars are coming in and out, and, and buses and so forth. Uh, so, this is really going to be designed uh, for the education of our students. Uh, where the current facility we're in actually was a former grocery store several years back, it became uh, corporate office for East Coast Corporation uh, prior to them moving or us moving into uh, the old library uh, on Rush Street. So uh, this is just a, a simple floor plan. Again, we continue to make tweaks and modifications. Um, some of the important spots tonight is for us to have some discussions. Uh, there will be nothing to vote on but to provide you know, a little more guidance. Uh, as next month we anticipate having what we call a 1028 hearing. It's an official project hearing uh, that will establish uh, some of the maximums, uh, some terms of the project, uh, and then we will move forward from there. So the timeline still kind of remains the same. Uh, 1028 hearing uh, in the April board meeting, and then moving through uh, the summer into early fall with uh, setting out the bid, bonding, uh, for uh, the uh, monies that we needed to, to uh, disrupt this project, along with the other project we're talking about as well is upgrading the HVAC at the central office. So again, I'm going to move through these slides or these uh, 
documents here. Uh, again, nothing in stone. It's all being rendered right now. It'll give you a little bit of an idea. Some of them are a little bit messy. Some of them are a lot of furniture in different places. It's just kind of help us give some ideas of what some things could look like uh, and what we like and don't like and so forth. So uh, again, this is this is the floor plan we kind of settled on. Um, it breaks it down into uh, several rooms, the main cabins area in the center, which still has some furniture, uh, the, the darker blue uh, on the left and the right uh, are classrooms, uh, and then the green is some smaller uh, group work areas, and then of course you have uh, mechanical storage, office space, and so forth. So uh, again, it's continued to be tweaked, uh, moved around, sizes adjusted, and so forth to meet the needs of our students. This is a basic drawing of what it could look like. Uh, from an exterior standpoint, uh, you have the front or the back elevations. These would be the side elevations as well, or could be. Uh, again, nothing set in stone, putting into some 3D renderings along the way. Again, just giving an idea of what it could look like. This is kind of a 3D rendering of what the interior may look like. Uh, again, you see a lot of furniture in there, but we are <coughs> just playing it around and playing some different things uh, to get an idea for, for feel. Uh, different, different looks, supervision is taken into place, and all of this security, safety, egress, um, we have all, all those uh, items uh, definitely uh, at the forefront of our conversations. Um, what is, uh, what's best for students in this type of an environment? You know, why is it they're looking for alternative placement of, of, of learning versus of the high schools? This, this shouldn't look like a typical uh, high school setting, as many of you uh, may be thinking or want to. This adds a little bit of color to it. Um, so these also here a little color from, from the inside, uh, one of the classrooms there. And then we get into some of the financing. So we talked before uh, about budgets a little bit, and still operating within those budgets. Um, I went back to Baker to get our, our CPA our firm that we're working with. Uh, to work through uh, some bonding information. This is our current debt load. The uh, line green uh, down at the bottom, that's the middle school, that's the referendum debt. Uh, it's paid off in 2033, I believe. I can't see that far away. <laughs> yeah, 2033. The blue is the rating debt left on the Transportation Technology Center. And so what you're seeing is as the debt's rolling off, we are continuing to invest in our facilities. Uh, since I've been here, uh, we have made significant renovations to uh, Rome City. Uh, we've done HVACs and roofs at uh, High School, uh, Novella, Southside. Uh, we have done, uh, we've completed a, a brand new middle school building, as you see the depth there, Transportation Technology Center. Um, we've done controls at Northside. We've touched almost every building uh, that I've uh, that we have here in East Noble, except for the AMC in the last 11 years that I have been here. Uh, so as you see the debt falling off, this is a good time uh, to start working uh, in that direction uh, to maintain our facilities and provide uh, the right environment, the right tools for our students and our staff uh, to provide the best education we can uh, for them. Um, this is right now our current uh, amortization schedules for both the debts uh, for the referendum debt as well as the um, Transportation Technology Center. Uh, this the calculation that goes through our, our total bonding capacity. This slide here um, is going to show you four options uh, of bonding. We talked about three different options the last time. Uh, one is if we just did one project, uh, the other one is if we did, and then the other two were if we did uh, the combined projects. Uh, we talked about some different dollar amounts. Here I have four options. Uh, two of them would be considered tax neutral, and two of them would be considered a tax increase. Uh, I understand the goal of the board is to uh, try to be tax neutral. Uh, tax neutral would be options one and options three. Uh, options one and two are a five million dollar bond, giving about four point eight two five million dollars available for uh, actual construction for both of the projects. Options two and I'm sorry, options three and four uh, have a total bonding of five point one eight million dollars, leaving about five million dollars for uh, the construction costs for both of the projects. Right now, again, there's no vote tonight. We're not, we're not uh, establishing anything. But at 10:20 here, we will have to establish the maximums. 
the maximum buffer going to bottom, the maximum uh, repayment terms, and just because we stake the maximum doesn't mean we can't come in less, doesn't mean we can't bond less, doesn't mean we can't bond more. So with that said, the payoff terms you see on options one and three are five years, four months. Those are the, the uh, tax neutral. Uh, if you pay it off approximately one year earlier, uh, you're going to save you know uh, a, a fair amount of interest. Uh, but those would be uh, considered an increase to the tax rate, the current tax rate. Uh, here are just some bar graphs that goes along with those options and the amortization schedules uh, as we move move forward. Um, right now is a, is a good time to do these projects. Um, if debt is falling off, we'll just maintain, keep that debt rate level and consistent so it's not bouncing up and down uh, for uh, our taxpayers uh, uh, and so forth. So as we move through, let me get to the slide so I can read it. This slide here will show you kind of what that looks like um, as far as the tax rate on different uh, values of homes within our taxing district. Uh, for example, if we remain tax neutral, uh, there would not be any increase uh, in the actual tax rate itself. Obviously, assessed valuation also adjusts your tax rate. So uh, as assessed valuation goes up, tax rates go down. As assessed valuation goes down, tax rates can go up, considering our you know, for keeping the level uh, all, all level or level and uh, equal. So there are lots of things to consider here. But this, this will show you um, in a couple of those options that we showed a tax increase, what that would mean to uh, an average homeowner that has an assessed valuation of, of $100,000. Um, if you're accelerated paid off a year early, uh, it would mean anywhere from $3.79 to $4.12. Um, on their on their tax bill, uh, which would be the increase. Um, if you have a three hundred thousand dollar home, you look at eighteen dollars and thirty five cents to almost twenty dollars. Um, and then if you go into your agricultural land, you know for one acre of land, it would be anywhere from twenty six cents to twenty eight cents. Or for a hundred acre uh, farm, anywhere from twenty five dollars and fifty four cents to twenty seven dollars and eighty two cents. Uh, commercial property, you're looking at about 11, uh, $11.20, $12.20 uh, per $100,000 of value of commercial property. So this just kind of gives you some information, gives you an idea. Some of the disclaimers they have down at the bottom, uh, some of the assumptions that, that they're assuming here uh, has to do with interest rates of, of you know, roughly 5.5%. So it's a pretty conservative uh, estimate at this point in time. It assumes no increase in that assessed valuation, uh, which by the time we bond, set or go to bond for these, um, we hopefully will know what our assessed valuation is to help us make a better decision on how that will impact uh, our, our taxpayers. Um, but depending on when those are released, uh, we may not know that. So, um, that's kind of the, the rundown. The next slide uh, shows you our current uh, tax rates uh, for 24 and go back to 2020 for the operations fund, the referendum debt, and the debt service funds. So the tax rates we're talking about have nothing to do with the education fund. This is not pulling money uh, from our tuition support, which is used to pay teachers uh, and support classroom instruction. So uh, that is the end of the presentation. Lord, what questions do you may have? Thoughts, comments? How many students did you say are at the ALC right now? Currently right now at 340 and 50. It, it depends on, um, it just depends on where, where kids are at. And that doesn't include the weight list, correct? It doesn't include those other weight lists. And we probably buy bonds. Yeah, yeah probably July, July, August time frame. The question was where, where the money comes from. It's the debt service fund. Uh, as you see on this slide here, we have the operations 
Uh, the referendum debt is at service fund. So uh, the referendum debt is only the middle school because that's what went through the referendum. It was voted in by the taxpayers. Uh, this is selling of geo bonds. Uh, because of the dollar amount, uh, it, is not, it is not required or necessary in order to move forward to maintain or continue uh, the, the infrastructure in our facility the best way. So. <coughs> Any else, folks? The other question regarding the LC or the central office HVAC, which we combined with this one. Okay, we've got a couple of months for CPF. Yeah. Thank you. So, the next item for discussion is just kind of a follow up around the capital projects fund, or not the fund, the capital projects list. Uh, every year when we go through the budget, the budget is presented to you in September, uh, adopted in October. Uh, there is a list uh, that has all kinds of problems on there, from carpeting to painting to uh, network upgrades to facility upgrades and so forth. Um, and just kind of get, remind you of where we're at. We're in the early stages of putting some of those plans into play, uh, but there are some things that are currently happening. Uh, we are putting uh, additional concrete down around our baseball and softball field areas uh, to make it a little more accessible um, for those that may be in a wheelchair or what have you uh, to get to and from uh, down in the field, but also the restroom from the softball area. Uh, we do have a friend in the audience who has some new bleachers on order. Uh, this should be here hopefully in the middle of May, they're telling me. Uh, hopefully I can get them sooner than that, but I can't, I can't guarantee that. So uh, we are working uh, on that. Lots of quotes when it comes to carpet, uh, painting, um, working in art rooms, family consumer science rooms, uh, asphalt and uh, crack filling in our parking lots, exterior um, cleaning, painting, interior painting. A lot of this, a lot of the painting we try to do ourselves, but there are some things just as far as that uh, aren't something that, that we should be uh, working with. So we do that to some, some of the uh, professional painters. Um, but I can tell you that uh, our new facilities director, uh, Joe Pastor, he's, he's, uh, he's getting a quick run through uh, what his free and summer will look like for a school corporation. Uh, he's doing very well. Uh, the maintenance crew, the custodial staff, um, building administration, uh, custodial teams, everybody is working really well together right now, uh, working through and, and setting up what those projects could look like this, this summer. Um, and we're, we're excited about it. So, uh, moving in the summer and doing some refresh in some of our buildings and, and cleaning them up and, and looking better and uh, all sorts of different improvements. But uh, uh, like on fencing, um, safety of our, of our kids, I mean, there's all kinds of things that we can play with uh, capital projects uh, and so forth. So, are there any questions on any of the capital projects? I or thoughts or comments? Thank you. Any late items? Any late items? I uh, Comments from Mr. Leach and uh, Dr. Grimaud. With the, yeah, so Dr. Grimaud being, uh, being out tonight, uh, I have some notes from her on, on uh, items that uh, she wanted to share. Uh, one, Chris and uh, I already took my, my thunder there, but congratulations to our show choir team. Uh, it was our premier edition of the group that came in second. Uh, it was outstanding, We're very excited for that. Um, we also had two students uh, attend the Tri-State Science Fair. Uh, Noah Jarrett from the high school and uh, Logan Golden from Wayne Center. Um, they did extremely well, we're moving on to the next level. Um, we had our middle school wrestling uh, team uh, won the conference championship, so they are going to eat champs. We're excited for them. Uh, I believe it's tough, tough wrestling, which is uh, kind of the, the, the feeder program that goes into the middle school and into the high school. Uh, went down to Indy, and while I don't know the final results, I've heard that they did very well. So we're excited for all those uh, those students, uh, coaches, parents, and so forth. So uh, very very proud of that. We also had unified bowling went to state and was 14th in the state. Winter Guard finished 12th in the state. And we had a gymnast, Kylie Walls, who went to the state and competed at that level for gymnastics. So, Teresa, or Dr. Rowe also wanted to share that the Frequently Asked Question uh, document has been created and posted on our website. That's the same document link that was communicated in the community newsletter last 
Sunday. Uh, you'll find it uh, under the menu uh, on the main East Nobles uh, Corporation page menu, District EN Community FAQ. The document will be updated as we receive more questions from our community. Feel free to email Dr. Carmel with any questions. Uh, we also congratulate Mr. Alex Stewart. He's the new East Noble High School football coach. So we're very excited to welcome him to our community uh, and within our organization. So congratulations to Mr. Alex Stewart. Anything else? Comments or questions from the board? I do. Um, Sherry? Yes. And your grandson and your husband. I'm saddened that that has happened to you, sir, young man. Um, we will pass this on to our superintendent. That's some of the things that we do when we hear comments and concerns from our parents and grandparents that I'm sorry that that's been happening. I do have one on the board. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. I'm sorry. Uh, Joel, when you spoke a little bit about the the, uh, the, the money, yeah, money comes from different pots. Yeah. That uh, I, I understand it comes from different pots, but it doesn't mean that it can't be dis distributed differently. Okay. I'm not saying it's. Yes, laws. It'll be a better conversation okay. on the phone. Um, board, um, as per board policy 9130, we have received a uh, written notice of a book review appeal. Um, the book is a stolen line, and uh, as per that policy, um, we will uh, have the opportunity to review the, the book prior to our next meeting, which will be April 20. Thank you. I'm sorry, I must be 24. Um, and at that time, after our review, prior, you know, during that time, um, up to that time, I should say, we'll have the opportunity to view that and uh, then take action upon that. Uh, I have a written book, it should be here um, when the Amazon man comes to our house. Um, whenever that, yeah, I'm hoping tomorrow or, or uh, Friday. So. Uh, after I read it, I'm more than happy to share it because it's something else that you have found out. So. I'm sorry? Yes. Uh, the, 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 no, the, the committee made, made a recommendation um, to, to maintain the book in the library, and um, it'll be the board's decision then to either hold that recommendation or to. Go a different way. Anything else? I'm just glad to hear the community foundations coming along. Um, I've been in other communities prior to moving back home, and they're wonderful in those communities. They've done great things, and it's really exciting to see it forming. It's a lot of work, but it's got great benefits. If you would like to. Join in, I'd be happy to <laughs> and you can carry forward. So, um, all right, yeah, I have, I have yes, ma'am. Um, I would encourage all of you to check out those frequently asked questions that they took um, time to put together and put on our website. Um, I know that I have been um, to blame for part of this, but please do not believe everything you read on Facebook and just blindly share it. Um, check out those, ask the questions if you're not sure reach out and ask. Um, we hear a lot about transparency and how the community wants that. But if you're only asking the questions on Facebook, that's not an appropriate place to receive transparency from the school administration and the board. So please check those frequently, quest ask questions out, or just reach out to your building administrators or our emails are available. Okay, with that said, uh our next meeting is at the high school on April 24th, that will be at 6 o'clock. Uh, immediately following um, our adjournment, we will um, go to executive session uh, to discuss personnel and possible acquisition. Uh, with that said, this meeting is now adjourned.